Welcome to the Lazy CEO Podcast, where Jim Schlexer, author of Great CEOs Are Lazy and founder of the CEO Project, features compelling experts and topics for CEOs of mid to large size companies. Now, let's get started with the show. everybody to another Lazy CEO podcast. My name is Jim Schlexer. I am your host um, and I'm the founder of the CEO project. Uh, today we've got an interesting topic and it, you know, it might not be for everybody, but um, it's something that I did and I've um, got a little bit of experience. Um, and you know, when I talk to people, they, they say, hey, maybe someday I'll do it. And so I thought it might be a to- something we get into and share uh, and it may be something for today, it might be something for tomorrow, but I think just laying some groundwork would be, would be uh, useful. So that is um, publishing a book. And, you know, you, people that live interesting lives, CEOs and other people, I think they all find that at some point they go, you know, maybe I'd want to write a book about my experiences and share them or, or for other reasons. And um, there's a whole methodology to this. And it's really, I, I think the most curious thing about it has been democratized over uh, the last number of years with a number of tools and uh, websites and so forth that allow kind of anybody to publish a book if they're willing to do you know, certain things themselves. Um, so I'm going to talk about all the ins and outs of how you do this. I've had two bestsellers on Amazon. Um, I'll talk about bestseller lists in a little bit uh, in different genre, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's fun. And uh, it has a value. So let's start with like, why? Like, why would you ever want to do this? Uh, you know, there's always like an ego, right? I want to be a published author. And, and some people, it's like on their bucket list. You know, I'm going to tick that one off. I'm going to climb a mountain. I'm going to, you know, sail the ocean. I'm going to write a book. And so writing a book is, 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 is just a personal self-actualization gratification thing. And if that's your goal, there are ways to do it to accomplish that if you don't have other objectives. I can tell you the one objective that you cannot have in publishing a book, which is I'm going to make a lot of money publishing a book because you're not going to make a lot of money. I can guarantee you. I mean, the math here and just in terms of expectation is that um, for business book, now maybe you got the great American novel in you and this is maybe a little different, but a business book, a best-selling business book might move eight to 10,000 books. That's a very, very good selling business book. A well-known business book could be eight, 10,000. Now you do see, Some of them that go insane and they'll sell a million or 2 million, but gosh, you know, you could probably name the ones that sold a million copies on a couple of hands, you know, good to great and a few others that are just, you know, household names. Uh, But that's probably not what's going to happen for you. So getting rich ain't one of the reasons to do this. Another is, and and this may be the real reason is uh, for your business to have a calling card particularly if you talk about something you know well because you're in the business of doing it. And that might be um, you're a tax accountant. It could be uh, tax strategies to you know, improve more money in your pocket, or it could be how to shelter income in a variety of methodologies. I mean, that's an interesting book for a certain number of people, and you would have deep expertise in the area, not a bad book. My first book was uh, Great CEOs Are Lazy, and that was really based on all of the work that we do with CEOs and having done you know, literally thousands of interviews with CEOs across time. And that built a, a view of what great ones do versus maybe more average ones. And there's the book. And, and because that's the nature of the work we do, it was a calling card. It was a credibility piece. You know, you can hand somebody a business card and they go, oh yeah, it looks good. But if you hand them a book, uh, it, it immediately establishes a level, level of credibility in the field of your choice based on the topic of the book. And so if that's aligned with your business, you hand that out and people go, oh, gosh, I guess he or she knows what they're talking about because they wrote a book. And I'm going to tell you that happens whether they read the book or they don't read the book. It almost doesn't matter whether they read the book or not. It has its own weight. So it's a, like a 3D calling card or a credibility piece, and it can have value right there. But there's maybe a little more subtle way to think about expectations with writing a book. And that is... Um, uh, the concept of a treasure map. Um, and there was a fellow, um, and I'm not going to remember his name, but it'll come to me later. He wrote a number of books around self-publishing, and he talked about a treasure map around your book. And that is that the book won't make you any money, 
but the book will lead people to do want to do business with you in some other areas of your practice. That could be, for example, people that want to have public speaking gigs will very typically have a book. Why? Because if they read the book and they like the content, they may well want to have somebody come and speak on that topic. And they're credible because they have a book. Other consulting firms do it. They write a book. People like what they're saying about economic value add or the tax strategies or HR techniques. And they go, boy, that's really interesting. We ought to have this firm come in and work with us. And so the treasure map is not the book. The book is an attractive force that brings other kinds of value to you. And I can tell you that's worked for us for the um, Great CEOs are Lazy book. It's directly about what we do. Lots of people have read the book. It, it, as I said, it was a bestseller. Um, and you know, people order it every week, every all the time. Now we get orders all the time for it. So it has like a long life in it. And we find people occasionally that were engaging in a conversation about maybe working with us, and they've already read the whole book, maybe twice sometimes, and even given it to their friends. So what's the probability that that individual is going to do business with us? Well, I would say very high because you know, you've already got immense credibility. They like what you're saying and off you go. And I'm going to say that that book has probably paid off for itself in terms of the investment. Gosh, I haven't really done the math recently, but 10 to 20 times what we put into it in money has come out in long-term clients because of the, uh, the credibility it was established. So that's our treasure map. Um, I know public speakers that publish a book on a topic and then that's their speech for the next two years, let's say, and they'll make hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars delivering that speech based on the book. And many times they'll sell books, but that's kind of an add on, you know, at their speeches, but that that's sort of an add on. It's not their core business, but you know, every little bit helps. So that would be kind of an expectation. Like why do it? Um, I will say there, there are some other reasons to do it. I know um, multi-generational uh, family businesses will occasionally do a book mostly to record the family history. And there's an interesting dynamic there of, as you record the family history of, and, you know, grandpa's are alive, there's three generations alive. And, you know, the, the senior most individual, male or female, is um, telling the stories of them and their parents, potentially, depending on how many generations we have. And you want to capture that for future generations so they, they know how we got here and they have respect for it. And it's not lost into time. What's funny is um, sometimes, you know, there's a little revisionist history that occurs in those conversations. Uh, something didn't happen right, or we did something that wasn't quite the way we maybe should have, could have, but hey, that was 80 years ago. And uh, people don't want to lay it out the way it really happened, even though, frankly, it probably makes a better story. But, you know, great grandpa is not going to look so great if we tell the story that way. So there is that dynamic. So I think the first question, once you say, all right, I think I got a, a, some content that's interesting for people, whether it's technical expertise or my story. The next question is, who's the reader? And that's really important. Now, obviously, great CEOs are lazy CEOs. That's who I was talking to, maybe senior management, but mostly CEOs. And, and because my treasure map said, I want to be talking to CEOs and those are my clients, that was clearly the target audience for the book. You might have a different book that says, you know, um, culture management, for example. Here are great techniques for culture management. And then now you're talking to a senior team, potentially, a CEO and their senior team on culture management. But, but let's get really clear about who am I going to be talking to? And I think really most importantly, what are they going to gain by reading this particular book? I mean, we've all got stories and stuff we can tell and little techniques, and, but you got to make sure that when they are done with the book, they've, you've delivered, for me, a good business book delivers four or five interesting new ideas. So your standard has got to be, you know, four or five really high quality, maybe, boy, I never thought about it that way, or a technique I can immediately deploy out of your book. That's a high value book in my estimation. So what are they going to gain? You got to be really clear about what's unique and, and gainable, if, if that's a word, from reading the book or listening to the pot via audio, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so who is important? And, and for me, the, 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 the quick thing to do to see if you got something is, you know, at the back of the book or in the inside flap, there is maybe three or four paragraphs that explain what the book is and what you're going to get from reading the book. Write that first. If you can't write four paragraphs, which will be the, the back matter or the cover matter, uh, that really would, somebody would read it and go, wow, I'd read that book. If you can't get to that place, then don't start the process. Get yourself to a point where you say, if they read that, 
and maybe you show it to some friends and ask them what they think. Would you read a book that did this for you? And the answer is, oh, heck yeah, that's awesome. Then, then you go forward. But if you can't get there, don't waste your time with the rest of the process. The next thing to think about is, um, well, I'm gonna set some expectations uh, before we get into this. Uh, first is what are you gonna spend? Uh, that can range depending on how you publish from let's say zero potentially, although it's not really zero, to maybe $60,000 you're gonna spend to get your book published. Uh, and that depends on which, which model you use, whether it's traditional publishing or self-publishing. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and for me, the first book took two and a half years to do. And, but continuous effort, it was probably a little over a year. I took a break in the middle because I had life, you know. Uh, the, um, the second book was a year, straight through, banged it out, no big deal. So let's say it's a year of work, part-time. 10, 20 hours a week for a year to get yourself a book. And, and the work varies as you go across. It's not all writing. It, it varies what you're going to end up doing. So plan for a year, maybe a little more, depending on how complicated it is. And round numbers, 40 to 50,000 words is your target kind of number. If you think about 250 words a page, uh, 40 is, what is that? I don't know, 160 pages and you know, 50 is... Uh, 200 pages, somewhere in that zone. That's about right for a business book. They've been getting a little bit shorter, but that's your kind of, you know, do you have 40, 50,000 words on it? And I can tell you the first book, I started writing it and I, I kind of exhausted my first pass of ideas and it wasn't, it wasn't that many pages. I, I got to go do some thinking to expand it so it can be big enough to be interesting. And so that's part of where the break came through. The intellectual property control is the next thing to think about. So when if you use traditional publishing, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment, you are effectively selling your intellectual property, your words, your ideas to the publisher. In other words, they own them going forward. Now, that's OK, because possibly you might get an advance. But, but frankly, unlikely, traditional uh, publishers are kind of under attack for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, and um, some are great, some are not great. You have to be careful about who to work with. So they own the rights. That's okay, except if the book is really interesting, because remember, it's about the treasure map. It's not about the book. If the book isn't selling well, like you, you maybe you sold your first whatever number of that first printing or so, and then it begins to slow down, you're going to get a call that says, hey, uh, Jim, uh, we decided not to publish any more of your books. We're not going to print anymore. Once this print run is done, we're going to discount them. We're going to move them out. We're done. We're not going to publish it anymore. You go, well, you know, that's okay. It's really useful for me in my business as a treasure map. I get speaking gigs or I get consulting work or people come to my company to buy uh, fans or, you know, generators or whatever. They go, yeah, about that. Here's the problem. We own the book. You can't do that. If we choose not to publish it, it isn't getting published anymore. We're not going to give you back the rights to publish that book because it's our intellectual property. So depending on the purpose of the book and the nature of your treasure map, you might want to have that book in market for a longer period of time. Uh, Great CEOs of Lazy was published in 2016. It's still in market now, seven years later, and selling all the time. Not in the volume it used to, but it still sells. And so if I had sold that to a publisher, I wouldn't, it might have stopped in a year or two or three years, who knows, because the volume wasn't enough for them to be interested. So if you want to own the intellectual property, you can go to a traditional publisher. That's sort of the, 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 the box you end up in. If you say, I need to own the intellectual property because even if it sells 500 books a year or 300 books a year and I get three or four clients off of that, I make enough money on the clients to make that interesting, then you need to own the intellectual property. So let's get into the models. So the traditional model is traditional publisher. And these are the big names, you know, uh, McGraw-Hill and uh, Harcourt and all those guys, uh, Wiley and so forth. And they publish a huge, Penguin, they publish a huge number of books. You'd have to be careful about which publishers you might go to because each of them publishes a different kind of book. And you probably need help in figuring that out. But you're going to do a treating, a treatment on your book, a couple of pages, maybe the first chapter is written. You send it to them and they will give you the thumbs up or thumbs down. We're interested in the book or we're not interested in the book. Or we're interested in the book with these modifications. For example, I, I fiddled with one of these once and uh, that was, they wanted to turn into a very, very different kind of book than I wanted. And I kind of passed on, on that opportunity. There's a chance they give you an advance. 
you know, as an early or first time author, that's unlikely, but if they did, it'd be small. You know, when you hear about these $4 million, $5 million um, advances, these are really very, generally very famous people. And, and that is actually interesting. The reason why a big publishing firm would publish your book is not because of the book. It's because you, your magnetic force, your social media footprint, your channels that you can bring the thing to market with are significant enough that you are going to move the books yourself. And so you go, well, wait a minute. I'm getting them to make the book and put it into to the distribution. And then my efforts are what's going to sell the book. What, and they get a big split for that. That doesn't seem fair. Well, that's the deal. So when you look at Oprah published a book or Michelle Obama and you got a $4 million advance, they know because Michelle Obama is going to get on every chat show and she is going to sell a gajillion books as a result of it. So they're very happy to engage her because her social media footprint is so gigantic. She'll move the books. Yours, on the other hand, is probably not the same as Michelle Obama's. And so you won't sell as many books and therefore you're not going to get a $4 million advance. And, and frankly, if it's not significant enough, they might say, you know, we just frankly, they may not say it this way, but what they're thinking is you can't move enough books through your marketing efforts to be interesting to us because that's the expectation of an author. You got to move the books. So the next model down is what they call hybrid. So this is somebody that you're going to pay money to. So now instead of them paying the money for all the stuff that needs to happen, and I'll go into what that stuff is in a minute, um, that you're going to pay the hybrid publisher to do it. They'll manage all of that. They'll get you into distribution. And that's their primary value in my estimation, because as an individual, it's very hard to get into distribution. You don't have the contacts. You don't have the people. It's, it's hard to do. Uh, there are some digital models that work, by the way. They'll do that for you. And they'll guide you through the process and they know what sells. And um, so hybrid is the next one. So that's like working with a firm. You still own the intellectual property. You spend the money, not the publisher. And then you are responsible for helping move the book still. Like that doesn't change even if you went to a hybrid publisher. Don't think you're going to write the book and then go, let the checks roll in, baby. I'm good. It doesn't work like that. You're going to have to go, um, you're gonna have to go do the work. So hybrid is the next one. There's a lot of good ones. There's some that are sort of higher end. They position themselves as we are positioned for affluent like CEOs that uh, don't want to do any work and they just want to pay one price and they don't really care what that price is. And we take care of, you know, white glove service all the way through down to you know, ones that where there's a shared work model where we'll do some work and you're going to do some work. And then the economics are a little different in that case. Um, by the way, in the case of a, a traditional publisher, you'll end up with a fairly small percentage of the revenue that's generated on the book. On a hybrid, you'll end up with a somewhat larger percentage of what's on the book. And then the third model is sort of self-published. Now, historically, that had uh, a really negative connotation. These were um, ego gratification books, books that like, I'm going to write about my cats or something that nobody cares about and it'll never sell or I'm writing it for my kids. Or... And so we self-published because nobody would touch the damn, the damn thing. That's changed. This is where it's really democratized. Self-publishing, um, and my second book was self-published. Uh, you end up paying all the money uh, for all the stuff that has to happen. You own the intellectual property. You have to get in distribution, and you have to help sell it. So you got, but you get the lion's share of the revenue that's available on the book because you did that. Uh, you can also control how long it stays in market as a result of that as well. And what's happened? This is where the democratization has happened. It used to be that all of the skills you needed around publishing a book were really available at the publishing house. They had cover designers and editors and blah, blah, blah at the publisher, kind of hard to get at them. That's changed. There are freelancers for everything you could possibly want. And some of them, frankly, are really, really good. And you use those instead of some you know, monolithic publishers uh, resources, you can pick and choose the ones that work for you. So self-publishing is a real thing. It looks a bit like hybrid. You probably end up putting an LLC together and publish under that name. Um, I did that for my first one. I think I published under uh, Potomac River Press is the name that it's published under. And that, you know, it's just an LLC that I own. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the downside on um, digital sort of self is you prop, well, you can do hardback, but there are issues with hardback. If you publish hardback, and I did on my first book, you end up having to do a longer print run and holding inventory, and then somebody fulfills for you. If you do soft cover, it can be 
when the order comes in, it's digitally printed and then it's sent out. So you hold no inventory. So the second book I did all softback for that reason. So let's go to the steps of publishing. And, and that might help uh, kind of as a last piece. And I'll explain the differences as we go through. <clears throat> so the first thing is writing the book. So I'm a really bad writer. Um, and uh, so, and I'm lazy. Uh, so <laughs> I didn't write it myself. Well, I did, but all my ideas, but I used a ghostwriter. And <clears throat> I spent a bit of time looking for ghostwriters until I found one that had my tone. And that's really the key thing in a, go in a ghostwriter. They need to understand your content area. So for my case, he was a business writer. He'd done work for a bunch of, you know, New York, uh, or, sorry, Wall Street Journal and Inc. Magazine, a bunch of others. He knew business at some level. And he was a good writer, obviously, so his job. And his tone was informal and kind of right where I write. Um, you know, there are other writers that might be more formal or not understand the content area. They wouldn't have been good fits for me. So basically, all my ideas, I would dict we would frame the book chapters, and then I would dictate the book. Not, not dictate. I would talk. I would talk the book. Hour, two-hour session. He would capture it on audio and uh, making notes. And then a few days later, chapter one would be back in my inbox and I could edit it. And then we did that through three, four, five, six, whatever number of chapters we have. It's a pretty typical model for a ghostwriter. <clears throat> Interview and they write it. If you look at um, Michelle Obama's or Oprah's or multitude of you know, celebrity level, do you, do you really think they wrote that book? Probably not. They had a ghostwriter that sat with them and e interviewed them, wrote it up, and then they would then edit it based on, oh, you didn't quite get that right. Or no, I'm not meaning that. I mean this. And, and that it's just easier. Anybody who's creation versus editing, editing is easier. So a ghostwriter, depending on who they are, 20, 40, 50,000 bucks, depending on who they are. Um, a famous one that's got multiple bestsellers might be at the higher end. Somebody who's still getting into it might be at the lower end, maybe even a little lower than 20 if you get lucky. But it's probably not an area to skimp. You probably want to spend the right amount of money to get a decent writer because I think the quality of the writing matters. But you want them to be a storyteller in your voice. So that's the key thing. Because you know, some of us, particularly if we're in more technical disciplines, we're not the greatest storytellers in the world and uh, we need help. And, and they'll press you. They go, hey, that's a great point. Tell me a story around that. Tell me a situation where that happened. And then they'll turn that into the story to make the point. So ghostwriters next. Once you've written the book, the process goes bulk edit. So you're going to hire an editor to sort of look at the big chunks and go, hey, this chapter belongs in front of that one. And I don't like how this whole line of thinking, we're going to move that somewhere else or they'll delete chunks of it or like really moving big blocks of stuff around. Those guys don't cost their gals, guys or gals don't cost that much. Um, thousands, few thousands. Um, then you'll go to a, once you get it sort of structured, you'll take that feedback, edit it again. Once you've got that, you go to fine edit, and now they're looking at more word structure, proper grammar, was it used the way it should, moving sentences, clarifying. Uh, again, you read through that, accept or, or don't accept, you modify it, and then finally you go to proofreading. And they're going to proofread. These are phenomenal people because they do stuff I would never do. Uh, and again, you could find them freelance on freelance.com or Fiverr or other ways, uh, and they will very, very detailed, go through your book, making sure every period, every comma, every citation is exactly the way it should be. And most of us don't have the patience for it, but people that are good at this are worth gold um, as a result of it. Again, each of these is a few thousand bucks of those people. Um, then you need cover design. <clears throat> I talked about writing the cover material, but you need the right picture to show what your book is about. Like a lot of people, when they're either on Amazon or in a bookstore, They'll look at the picture, and the picture should tell me what that book is. If it's some random like guy at a desk, it doesn't mean anything. Now, having said that, my first book did have a guy at a desk, but he was leaning back, arms behind his head. He was being lazy. And then with the title, Great CEOs are Lazy, you're like, oh, it's like about CEOs being lazy and being great at the same time. And that is what the book is about. So it told the whole story. If you didn't read anything else, you'd kind of get a feeling for what the book was about. Um, and the title matters. Spend a lot of time on the title. Uh, sometimes we come up with something quick. And, and for me, I, I went through multiple, multiple iterations for both of my books to find the right title and subtitle for them. Super important. The title and the picture sell the book. And then the cover matter would be the third thing that's super important. Tell me what's in the book and why I should invest the time. 
So cover dime, spend the money, spend the time on cover design and iterate until you are super happy with it. And it's frustrating to like, ah, I wish I could just be done with this process, but you got to keep going until you go, oh my gosh, that's it. And even when I got to, oh my gosh, that's it. I showed it to a bunch of people and said, what do you, what do you, which of these two do you like better? Why do you like it? Trying to gain feedback from the kind of people I might be hoping would buy the book. So that's really helpful. <clears throat> now, at this point, you might be saying, geez, Jim, like that seems like a heck of a project, like hire these people, manage them, get all this stuff, da, da, da. You know what? You're right. So really, and I did this in reverse order because I was trying to make a point that there is a lot of details, including I haven't even gotten into the distribution side of it. There are a lot of details here and there are people out there called, they call themselves book wranglers or book rabbis or book coaches or whatever you want to, not expensive, some thousands of dollars, and they will help you through this process. So they don't own the book. They are just there to help you as a service. Um, and you know, they all right, let, let's get the manuscript together. All right, you, we need to get it bulk edited. I got five people that I know that are really great at that. Let's pick one of them. Boom, we do that. Okay, we're through that. You've accepted, let's get a fine editor. I've got 10 people that I know are really good who I've worked with before. And that's the cool thing about them. They know people. I don't go on Fiverr and hope to heck that I get a good one out of the thousands of people that might respond. They dealt with these people. They're known good. And they might be a little more money, but they're known good. And I've had people that went through bad, and they'll even get you a ghostwriter if you need it. I, I know people that have gone through two or three ghostwriters, spent significant sums of money because you know you pay the money they did the work even if you don't really love the work um, until they found the one that was the right one for them and so a book wrangler can really help you narrow down on the right person quickly so you don't make those mistakes and that's copy edit proofread cover design everything including and in, in that particular one that i work, work with um she found me the the cover designer that we use and she is phenomenal i never would have found this woman and she is phenomenal so there's a value in getting a book wrangler. Again, costs start going up. So you got to be really clear that if I'm going to put 40,000 bucks into this thing or whatever the number is, um, and my first one, I think I put in 38,000 or so to get the book put together, maybe just maybe 40. And the second book was a little cheaper, maybe uh, 20 or 22, because I was smarter about it the second time around. Um, the book wrangler makes a big difference though. So get a book wrangler and they'll help you through these steps that I'm describing. So you don't have to project manage the thing yourself because that's a pain in the butt. The other thing they'll do. So once you get to sort of, there's a manuscript that we like, it's formatted the, and formatting is important. Like make sure it looks pretty and the font is right. And if you use little pictures and icons, include those or the graphics you include, they'll help you with all that process. So, you know, there's a lot to do here. The book wrangler is important. And you don't have to, you, you know, you might sketch that graphic on a napkin, you send it to their graphic artist that they use, and it comes back and you're like, oh my gosh, that's exactly what I wanted to say. And it looks beautiful now, and you never would have done it the way they did it. So they have those kind of resources that you don't have. So self, and by the way, you can do this all yourself if you want to, and that's the cheapest way to do it, but um, you run the risk of quality. And I think particularly if we're looking for something that's going to be a treasure map to other things we do, you want it at the right quality level because it's it's sort of the representation of you in the market. Uh, funny story, quickly. Um, I had my book proofread by multiple people, my first book. A friend of mine, she comes over, never seen the book. She opens it up to a random page and goes, oh, that word's spelled wrong. Like, how the heck do you have? <laughs> she happens to have a gift for this particular capability. And it was very frustrating that somebody read all 50,000 words and she missed the one that she found first. I think it may have been the only, actually there was one other error and we fix that on republish by the way, but people will find errors if you don't really pay. And we really paid attention and we still had some errors. So it happens. Um, by the way, a publisher, this is where they shine. They will go through that thing with a fine tooth comb, have multiple proofreaders, unlikely to find a mistake like that in a book that's been done by a a traditional publisher. They're very, very tight on those things. So now you've got your book, you've got your manuscript. Publisher, they take it from there. They'll do, they, in fact, they'll design the cover. And, and I've had um, a couple of people who said, hey, I wanted this as my title. And the publisher made me change the title. It isn't what I wanted it to be, but they thought it would sell better. And they have that right because they're going to be on the hook for the revenue to sell the book. 
they will then take the cover and the, 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 put it together into a book. They'll go out and market it to the various channels, Barnes and Noble, so forth, um, as well as other distribution channels that are out there. They'll get the ISBN numbers that you need to have so they can scan a book uh, when you buy it. All that jazz, they do all that stuff for you. Including things like, depending on how it flows, like airport bookstores. I'll talk about them. I should talk about them right now. So most distribution, you just put the book into distribution. You're exposed to the risk of returns, which kind of stinks, like if it's damaged or whatever. But you don't have to pay to play, unlike like supermarkets. Airport bookstores are different. And, and particularly for a business book, people say, I really want to be in an airport bookstore because my clientele travel and they walk by those bookstores. And I'd love to be the book on that like front table and everybody will walk by and then they'll buy bunches of my book. This will work out great. So I have a little story to tell you. Every single book on that, on that table paid to be there. Round numbers, 40,000 bucks a quarter to be on that front table. If you want to be in the bookstore, like on a facing so you can see the book or end cap, that might be 20 or 25,000, but you've got to pay to play to be in an airport bookstore. Most people that do it will tell me, have told me, I never did it by the way. Most people will tell you it more or less covers its cost. In other words, what you make on the book against the cost of being in the, the paying to be in the, in the bookstore more or less equalizes. And so it's free, but again, if you don't care about what you make on the book, it's about the treasure map, it's the speaking, it's the consulting, it's the product then fair enough, let's do it. Because the more people that read it, the more come to me for other stuff that I want to sell them. So, so if you do it yourself or use your book wrangler, you'll generally go into more digital on demand. My, particularly my second book was like that. So we went into Amazon, obviously Kindle, because once you've got the manuscript, it's digital. It's easy enough to turn it into a digital book. Uh, you can also sell through other digital book platforms that are out there. But frankly, Amazon controls the, the universe on online purchase of books. The question I asked myself was, when was the last time I bought a book at any place besides Amazon? And my answer was almost never. I said, well, then I'm just going to be on Amazon because I don't miss much of the market with that. It is cool to go into a bookstore and see your book there. But like, frankly, most people don't buy books that way. Um, so that's a little ego rub and it's fun, but um, it's not common. But you can go into distribution channels where it's available to all these independent bookstores. So I have an independent bookstore I go to called Politics and Foes. I could go there and ask them to order my book, bring it in for me, and then I could get it through a local bookstore. But unlikely they would ever put it you know, on a shelf uh, unless they were doing something special. Uh, the other thing you might, so digital comes automatically, Kindle, whatever, comes automatically, Nook, whatever your reader is, and, be, and you have to put it in the right channel, your book wrangler will help you. Amazon does both of them, by the way, and they'll also allow you to sell to other parties. Um, and round numbers you make, by the time it's all done, you, on a completely digital book, which would be either an audio a, a audio book or a Kindle book or a on-demand printed book, you'll make about 35% on the face price, more or less, or 35% after, after costs. So 35% of the margin, let's say. Uh, so that's my books. I make about five or six bucks a book. It's not a ton of money. Um, and it adds up, but it's not a ton of money. Um, audiobook is another thing to consider. About a third of all people like to listen to audiobooks. The one piece of advice I'll give you, which was given to me, is if you have uh, a reasonable voice, uh, as a friend of mine says, a, a, not, a not displeasing voice. <laughs> and some of us have displeasing voices, but you know, a voice that people don't mind listening to you could read your own book. Um, there are studios that will help you do an audio book. They'll record it for you, put it in format, pub, put it up on Audible so people can download it. Again, you need cover art for that. That's not expensive. If you go to a smaller studio, it might be two, three, four thousand bucks to get an audio book. Well worth it. What I have found is people that listen to my audio book, when they meet me later, they because I've, I've spent five hours with them reading the book to them. They feel like they know me and they've got some of my personality. They've heard my voice. And so when they meet me, it's a little bit weird for them, but it's really good because it, the familiarity is instantaneous. So if you want to do it, A, I'd recommend an audio book and, um, and uh, read it yourself. I did on the first book, try like a professional, you know, announcer guy. 
and he had the most gorgeous voice. I mean, oh my gosh, like, hello, this is so and so. And but the problem was, he didn't know how he didn't understand the content. He was just reading words, so he didn't know how to in, uh, do the intonation. He didn't get the right dynamics to it. He didn't know where to make the uh, kind of emphasis. And it just was, it fell flat for me. So I paid the money, but I ended up ditching that and just doing it myself. So I'd highly recommend doing it yourself. So there's a book in a box. And actually there's a company by that name uh, that helps you, they're a hybrid publisher. You know, there's a lot of moving pieces, but um, I think the big ones take away are, what's your treasure map? Preference towards all digital, no inventory, which means no hardcover. Own your intellectual property, which means hybrid or self-published. And, you know, there's a lot of details in a little work, so make sure you get some help. Uh, and if anybody wants to chat more about publishing a book, um, I'm happy to help you and uh, chat with you a little bit or point you to some people that can really help you know way more than I do. Uh, but thanks again for listening. We really appreciate you spending time with us. We'll see you next time on the Lazy CEO Podcast. Cheers. This podcast is brought to you by The CEO Project. At the CEO Project, we work with CEOs to help them grow their business. Uh, and our members represent billions of dollars of revenue and profit. And frankly, amongst all of us, we've probably made every mistake in the book, including some you haven't made yet. So if you want to learn from the experience of a bunch of really seasoned CEOs, we're a great place to hang out. In this podcast, what you're going to hear are some of those ideas, concepts, and things that are just going to help you on your journey. If you want to find out more, reach out to us at theceoproject.com or you can contact me personally at jim at theceoproject.com. Happy listening. Thanks for listening to the Lazy CEO Podcast. We'll see you next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes and check out our website, www.theceoproject.com.